Good morning, everybody. It's Peter here from AJS, and it's my delight to once again take you into a jeweler's workshop somewhere around Australia. And this week, we're going to sunny Geraldton and have the pleasure of the company of Penny Layton. Good morning, Penny. Good morning, Peter. Hi, everybody. Welcome to my uh, studio here in not so sunny Geraldton today. It's supposed to rain, but that's okay. We need to. <laughs> oh, it's our secret that it's not sunny. Yeah. And, <laughs> We've also got the company of your husband upstairs. Who, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a horse. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. So, Penny, uh, today we're going to be doing some texturing using a rolling mill. So um, I'm sure our audience will be pleased to understand what tricks you get up to there. Would you like yeah. to explain what you're going to get up to today? Yeah, um, I really enjoy using my rolling mill um, for lots of things. Don't judge me on my mill. It's, um, <laughs> it is um, a bit well used and, um, and I probably don't look after it as well as what I should do, but um, that's okay. So uh, you can use your rolling mill for a whole variety of reasons um, and things you can use it to, to um, uh recycle metal and you can make wire you can make square wire you can do all sorts of things with it um the canisters can come in and out you can even get um some of the canisters that have imprints on them already but mostly i like to just use found things whether that be paper or plant life um, i have used feathers but they are a little tricky to use and then you can use that texture that you imprint into the metal uh, in your jewelry and um, you can also do things like oxidise it after the imprint has been put into the metal um, to make that imprint stand out a little bit more. So I just thought it would be fun maybe just to show um, some of the things that you can do using your rolling mill um, by texturising some metal. So no, that's great. And to do it organically is, um, yeah, that's a treat as well, Penny. Yeah, you just got to be a bit tricky or careful what, with what you use, especially if it is an organic matter. Um, really, really important that we don't get any water on our, um, our rolling mill at all. We don't want anything like that or any acids or anything. Um, so you've got to make sure that anything that you put through the mill is dry. And, I mean, it is, a, it is just a path of experimenting um, because, you know, some things that you think about have a lot of texture often don't work. Um, it, I find that all the time. I think this is going to look amazing. And then when I put it through the mill, I'm like, oh, that didn't work at all. And it does take a little bit of practice to know how much pressure to um, apply. So um, it, it is just like anything when we're making jewellery, it is just a process of keep practising and experimenting. So I guess um, make sure that you practise with your base metals. Don't go using all your expensive metal to do any of your experimenting, use some copper or some brass. Both of those metals are more than fine to, to use. Um, and, and make sure that you anneal any of your metals as well so that you're not putting anything too hard through the mill or you're having to turn the mill up so hard for it to go through. So um, if you like, I'll start doing some um, squishing. Some Let's imprint. do it, Penny. Yeah. All right. So, so you just, um, a... I'll just, before you start, I'll just... Uh... Yeah invite our audience if you'd like to say good day and mention where you're from somewhere around Australia that'd be wonderful probably to have you yeah. on board this is on my screen I keep getting a message on there we go um so I just went ahead and prepped a whole bunch of metal because um uh, I didn't think we needed to go through the whole how to anneal a piece of metal um so I've and I've just cut up a whole bunch of little bits of mm -hmm. copper and I've got a little piece of silver that I will um texturize just so that we can see what it looks like on the silver as well. Um, so uh, I quite like using things like um, fibrous papers. So this is some handmade paper that I've bought from a local lady that um, does really amazing stuff with handmade paper. And that's got some um, just some natural fibers. She uses all natural um, products in all of her papers. And then um, other things that I've find that I use are often just around the house so some um, kitchen sponge uh, I've also been known to cut um, not while it's in the window but fly screen um, and you can actually get the fly screen and put um, uh, use a pen and just distort it and put holes in it and then that almost looks like a um, animal skin kind of pattern it comes up that comes up really cool but um, mm -hmm. yeah uh, and then um, I've got some 
this is uh, a ribbon. But that's it's quite a soft ribbon, and um, that puts a nice texture as well. This is just some paper that like scrapbooking paper, and that's glitter, and that's quite risen, so that makes a nice pattern. You can also use things like sandpaper, but you must make sure that that your sandpaper or anything like the fly screen that I mentioned is sandwiched between two pieces of, um, co of metal so that, um, you know, that doesn't imprint onto your canisters of the rolling mill. That would be disastrous if I want to do anything like that. Um, materials as well. I've got some like burlap or ha hessian that works really good and you can distort that a bit as well. So um, uh, the metal that I've prepared, uh, I kind of cheated and also used my guillotine. So I've got nice straight edges. But if you're using a saw and you were sawing out your pieces, you'd want to make sure that um, just use uh, some sandpaper and just uh, sand off any edges, any rough pieces, any tags from your sawing so that none of that imprints into your um, rolling mill. And I've just cut a bunch of just little pieces so that I can experiment and play today and show you. So once I've got my metal prepared, I've annealed it so it's nice and soft. Um, we'll choose something. Let's uh, go with the burlap. That makes quite a cool pattern. And, um, and also remember that whatever you put through your rolling mill, once it goes through the rolling mill, it's destroyed. Um, so again, don't go using any of your favorite vintage lace and hoping that you'll be able to use it again, <laughs> because once it comes out the other side, there is no going back. Um, so with something like Hessian, um, I don't really need to sandwich it, but the, the thing about sandwiching as well, you could sandwich between a piece of copper and a piece of silver, the same size. Um, piece that you're using of your um, copper and then you're going to get two pieces that are going to have the impression so that's another reason that you might want to sandwich sandwiching also stops um, the piece that you're imprinting into the metal from moving around a little as well so if I just go over to my rolling mill I've just what I've cut is a piece of hessian that's about the same size as my metal you don't really want um, anything sort of hanging out too much. I might just trim that back a little bit there. And like I say, it is a little bit of um, experimenting to get it right. Um, now, <laughs> I have got on my um, rolling mill an arrow because this is a, quite an old one and um, some of the others have... Um, figures and numbers up the top here and it tells you which way to roll it and I can never remember which way to roll my <laughs> roll wheel so I, I had to draw an arrow because there's nothing like just getting it right and then rolling it back the wrong way so I've got an arrow pointing that that means I need to take it down smaller or I need to open it up if I go the other way so yeah well so done. I wind it down and I just like test it up so I, at that point if I was to roll that through, it's just going to roll straight through and hardly impress onto the metal at all. So I want to make it just a little um, tighter. And really you want to just take very small turns. Um, again, I want to go just a little tighter. I need it to be able to gr grab it um, without – There's you never want to uh, have it so tight that you've got to force the handle around because this is not good for your rolling mill. Um, so just tweaking it until it feels like it's gripping it. So that feels quite good. It's gonna, it's holding quite firm. And so then I'm just simply, I'm just gonna hold onto that hessian so it doesn't slide around too much. Take it right through. I'll show you what the hessian looks like. It's already crumbled in my hands. So you can see that it's perishing like it's, um, just oh, crumbling okay. in my hand. Yeah, so you can't, there's no two, two uses. But the metal, though, is Oh, now. wow. Yeah. Can you see that okay? That's great. So uh, another thing to remember is that once it goes through the mill, uh, you're thinning out your metal. If you were using it um, to make a ring out of or something like that, don't go cutting the exact... Um, length for your ring because the metal will be thinner, it'll distort a little bit. Uh, so imprint and then take any measurements or anything that you want for your piece. So that's Hessian. That's what Hessian looks like. Uh, let's try um, 
some of this, uh, I really like this piece. It, it has a real nice um, kind of ocean feel to it. So it's more uh, ribbon than what I need for my piece of copper. So I'll just trim it back to, to the right size and then um, back over to the middle and pretty much the same thing. And I like to have the piece that I'm imprinting on top so that I can um, see where it's going, what it's doing. I think that might be okay. I might just go. The hessian was just a little bit thicker, so just turn it a little bit more. So you impressed Silver with your uh, hessian. He was very impressed. He said a big wow. So good to have you back on board, Silver. Thank you for being here today. So that one that I just did, a um, little lighter impression. Oh, sorry. You all right? Yep. Oh, it's coming up with a message on my screen. Sorry. Um, I've got the lines going. So I could have used with just a little bit more um, tighter because I've only really got the lines that are running across this way. Okay. Yeah. I'm going that way. So if I show you this piece that I had done uh, at another time, that was a bit firmer and I've got far more of the impression of the ribbon mm, on there. That's a lovely texture. Yeah, really cool. Uh, so uh, as I was saying before, you can oxidise um, the metal so that you can see the imprint a little more. So I've just done, uh, painted some liver of sulphur on there and left it to dry. And uh, I'll just send it back a little bit so that you can see what it looks like. I usually just use some of my, um, I think they're called 3M papers, mm -hmm. uh, and I just rub off some of that. liver of sulfur to so wherever the um imprint is a divot in the metal that's where the liver of sulfur will stay and then the surface will uh, come back to the silver and it makes the pattern stand out a little more and that was some um paper i think that has some fibers in it uh, okay. so this was a I might do this one on the silver so that we can see what it looks like on the silver so this was um I think it's like a laser cut piece of paper so it's still paper but it's um it, there's quite some some substance to it and it was an invitation I think that I found in spotlight so I'll just cut that a little bit smaller And then I'll run this through the mill and we'll see what it comes out like. Try and line it up on my. Just a little firmer. Because I really want this one to um, make a good impression on the metal. Slip a little bit, but I'll get the idea. And again, my piece of paper is uh, no longer in the same state that it was before it went in. I'm just that message in there. It's not in Western Australia anymore. <laughs> no, that's it. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> but um, how cool was that? <laughs> wow. Gee, that's great. Yeah. So, I mean, and you can see, it, like, it's really quite um, warped, the metal, but you would just anneal that again and then you could, um, I always try to protect the pattern that I've put into the metal by putting some masking tape over the top of it so that um, that helps protect it while I'm hammering or do anything with it. But you would just then hammer that straight back out um, and then continue to work with it. Um, what else can we play with? Let's do some of this paper because this um, this is also some like um, paper with glitter on it, so it's a bit risen up. Okay. And it makes quite a good. And maybe I'll sandwich something so that uh, you can see what that's like when I sandwich it. Let's... So Penny, just before you go on, yeah. Um, just in your jewellery making journey, uh, how far into it was it when you first got your first rolling mill? Uh, 
um, there's a ring that I make that um, it was a project that I um, we did as a, to learn a skill in soldering and I really, really loved the ring a lot and um, I just this, I badgered my husband until <laughs> I, I got a rolling mill because I really wanted to make more of these rings that they're yeah. um, and um, I needed the rolling mill to make the ring. So um, I was probably, because um, they're an expensive item to buy, but um, you can do lots of things with it. So um, I, it probably, I was probably only a couple of years, only for a couple of years into, the, into jewellery making, but um, that was because I really, really wanted to make more of those rings more than anything. Yeah. And then, so how essential a part of your tool repertoire is it now, having the rolling mill? Um, I don't use it every day, but I no. do use it, you know, on a weekly basis. I don't use it probably uh, to its full potential because I don't ever change the canisters out. I don't um, roll my own metal or pull my own wire or anything like that. So um, there's still lots for me to learn how to use the mill to its fullest potential. But um, uh, I do really love having it in, in my studio and when I have my own workshops as well, people love using it, love experimenting, doing stuff like we're doing today. Like it's a really great um, thing to use within your uh, jewellery making, I think, because it changes just a flat piece of metal into something that's got so much more to it. Mm -hmm. And just the fun of experimenting with things is, you know, like like we were sort of saying before, using um, natural and organic matters. And um, if you can ever find even just looking for artificial leaves and matter like that can also, because it just anything can make such a big difference to the, the metal. Uh, all right, let's try it. I've sandwiched um, my paper in between the two pieces of copper so uh, maybe what I can do is well, let's put another piece of paper so if I'm going to use two pieces of metal I may as well try and maximize um, the metal let's not waste metal so I'm going to cut another piece of paper the same size and uh, that way both sides because if this was a piece of fibrous paper or something else that was the kitchen sponge or something like that, well, then it would already have uh, texture both sides. But because this is a piece of paper, it's got nothing on one side and the glitter on the other. So now that's going to be way too close, those canisters, because now I've got two pieces of metal that I'm going to put through. So I've wound it out and then I go back to trying to find that sweet point. Just touch them all. Let's see what happens. So it's um, it's a bit tricky to see on the copper because uh, I probably I should have sanded it back a little bit. You might not be able to see that. Art. It might be a bit hard to see. I think, but it was the honeycomb one. That one. Yeah. Um, it's only very quite faint, but it yeah, came out. On, yeah. yeah, came out on both pieces, but um, yeah, and it's just a matter of trial and error. Um, I did earlier this morning try some um, that's some seaweed I picked up off the really lacy, pretty stuff I picked up off the, uh, the beach and uh, a sponge, but um, not entirely happy with what the sponge was a bit. Yeah, doesn't really, nothing like the sponge. It's too, you know, if you squeeze that, it, it goes quite flat. So okay. um, the other lacy uh, seaweed, I did one go and probably had it too tight and it just smished it and then I um, didn't have it as tight and you won't be able to see it, I don't think. Um, and it did leave a little imprint in, to, in it. But you've got to be so careful once you start sanding the pieces if you're making it into jewellery because uh, you don't want to remove the pattern that you've put on the metal. Um, is there anything else that you'd like me to, to show you or do? Um, well, we can invite uh, 
some comments or questions yep. from our, our viewers. And uh, Silva has a question, and there's something you alluded to earlier about using plant leaves. He says, uh, would you be able to use plant leaves like gum leaf or geranium leaf? Yes, you can. You just got to make sure that it, it's dry. Um, and sometimes when um, we see these leaves and they look amazing uh, when they're green, once they dry, they actually become too um, crisp and crunchy and they don't actually work. They just crumble and they don't leave an impression. So uh, because you don't want, if it's green, you don't want any moisture coming out of the um, plant life onto your mill. So um, and I did read something earlier while I was just doing a bit of sort of research to make sure I was telling everybody the right stuff, um, that uh, some papers have acid in them, so you should use uh, non-acid paper because while you put the paper through the mill, the acid can come out of the paper and also leave that on your mill and then that will um, etch into your, your canisters as well. So. Um, it's really important that you, if you are pickling the metal after you've um, annealed it, that you rinse all that pickle off so there's no acid on it or anything and dry it. I usually um, don't even trust my own drying. That sounds weird. I will um, pickle it, dry it, leave the metal before I, you know, for, you know, 10 minutes or something so I know that it's there's absolutely no water, no moisture on it before I go putting it through the mill. Just, um, you know, especially somewhere when you live coastal, rust is such an um, evil disease anyway, you know, you don't really need to encourage it uh, onto any of your tools. So, um, yes, you can use organic matters and plant leaves and things like that. You just have to make sure that they're dry and it'll be just a matter of experimenting. Um, I did uh, find like a skeleton leaf that looks amazing. Um I wonder what um, if you were ever lucky enough to have like some lizard skin or something like that, you know, how they shed. I mean, something like that might work as well. It'd be cool if you could get that to work. Um, and just always remember if you're using anything that sandpaper or metals or anything that's abrasive or, um, it, you know, that's quite aggressive, then sandwich it between the metal. Don't just roll it like I was with the um, uh material on top of the metal with um, straight onto your canister because that will just imprint into your canister and then it'll be there forever. Yeah, and you've ruined it. So, yeah. That, and it, it's a tool you'd like to keep for life, that rolling mill, really. So, yes, yeah. 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 So uh, Tinnika asked, uh, was the metal annealed before putting it through the mill? And you said that was yes. the case? Yeah. yeah, very important to anneal the metal um, before you put it through. Um, I traditionally use um, nothing re really thicker than 0 0.8. Um, I mean, it, it, I, you still have to anneal the metal. I just think, um, again, winding it up too tight just is not good for the mill. And if you can use a you know, thinner metal, then best to do that, I think, than trying to um, force something through that's a bit thicker and um, you know, having to add so much pressure for it to imprint. So, um, but there's no rule of thumb that says out there that you, you have to use 0 0.8 or thinner, but um, it's just maybe a little bit easier and gentler. But definitely anneal the metal. And if you've used a saw to cut the metal, just file any of the edges. You only need your um, emery stick with some sandpaper on it. You know, just take away any edges. Make sure there's no little tags anywhere. Because if any of those little tags remain uh, on the mill and you don't realise, and that is probably more than likely the case, you probably won't realise that they've stayed behind. The next time you put something through, uh, those little tags are going to be on the canisters and then they're going to be imprinted into your piece or um, it works into the canister. So it's just, and like I was saying, it's an expensive tool. It's not something that, yeah, you want to um, ruin overnight. You want, you know, you want it to, it's a lifetime tool. Take care, look after it. Indeed. Now we've got a couple of uh, questions and comments. Uh, so, <laughs> Silva would like to know um, yeah, could you use a snake skin? Yeah, I wonder about that. Like, it, again, it's just going to be through experimentation. Um, it could potentially work. I think that would be kind of cool. I have used some papers that um, have like a snake skin or alligator print on it and they've worked okay. Um, and the necklace that I'm wearing um, today, because you could also say, for instance, um, 
cut out shapes or drill holes into the piece and then put that uh, against another clean piece of metal and run it through and those shapes that you've cut out will imprint onto uh, the piece of metal and that kind of looks funky as well. But the piece that I'm wearing um, today, yep. on top here, this is um, copper wire that I just bent up into and it was 18 gauge, so one millimetre thick. And I just bent it up with my pliers and all sorts of weird and wonderful shapes, soldered that onto a piece of silver and then used a piece of copper, I just sandwiching, you know, one piece of silver with my wire, the other piece is copper, ran it through the mill, and then so this is the reverse print or the indentation of this. This is the indentation of that. And then I've just um, used wire to, to connect it together. Um, so, great. Yeah. yeah, you don't have to think about things that are, you know, wafer thin. Um, you just need to take care, though, when you do it. And uh, mm. if you are soldering anything onto something, you've got to make sure that it's soldered really well because as you put it through the mill, um, it, it, if it's not soldered properly or well to that other piece of metal, it'll pop off. Um, and just careful that, like I've shown you, um, whatever comes out the other side is often not in the same state that it started in. So um, you've got to make sure that you if you're going to do something that you want to keep the piece that you're running through, that you haven't wound it up so, so tight that it's, you know, ruined the piece altogether. But I've definitely done um, pieces of metal that I've cut shapes out of and then run it through the mill, and that looks kind of cool. Yeah, indeed. So uh, Fliss said that uh, she's found some lace that will give the same effect as the snake skin. Actually, one of the impressions you did earlier, yeah, lace. Too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, lace is really cool, and yeah. um, I'll show my age here. But um, I have used so I know that there's two two terms I know of. Yeah, we used to call it zigzag, um, and other people call it rick rack. So those people that are watching will hopefully know what I'm talking about with both of those terms. But it's a zigzag um, material that you would sew on the edge of a dress or like a child's dress or um, something like that and I've used um, zigzag and cut it all up into like little pieces and laid it all over the metal sandwiched it and run it through and that works really well but lace is really good like I was saying though don't go cutting up your um, vintage your grandma's vintage um, wedding dress that you were hoping to <laughs> maybe put the piece back later because it won't come out the same but lace is really fun um a, a scrapbooking shop is a great place to go hunting for stuff like that ribbons are really cool to use um that have patterns in them I, I like using ribbon a lot as well I found some um very thin metal ribbon that had ovals it made a great impression on the metal um but yeah it I like I keep saying it's just about experimenting just um, you'll start looking at things in a different way. You'll be like, I wonder what that looks like if I was to smush it through the mill. So, um, yeah, just, you know, cut it up, cut up things from the back of the dress, not the front of the dress. <laughs> <laughs> so Silver also mentioned uh, the sewing ribbon as well. So you're on the yeah. same train there. Yeah. And, yeah. and Fliss also asked, uh, what sort of maintenance do you need to do on your rolling mill? Uh, my, mine, you can, uh, this part here uh, comes all apart. That's how you, and you can get in there and uh, some grease on the wheels, on the cog, sorry, um, some WD-40 perhaps just to keep it all running nice and smooth. And the canisters, like I said, mine are in a really bad state um, because um, I probably haven't looked after them as well as what I should. And the rings that I was talking about before are pretty uh, rough on my canisters as well. Um, but these should be like a pristine, um, high-polished uh, silver. But um, in transit from, because um, this one came from America when I was living in America, and it came from America to Australia. And by the time we opened it up, it had actually got some rust on it. So um, I just, through the advice of the lecturer that I was working with in the States, he suggested that perhaps some very, very fine, like super, super fine sandpaper and just gently rub the rust off 
Um, I don't know if that's the right thing to do or not, but that's what I did. And it, I, it's smooth enough. I don't have any dents or gouges or anything in it. It just it looks worse than what it is. Um, but uh, I have seen um, another video explaining um, how to really look after your rolling mill in a much better way than what I've probably explained. But, yeah, that's kind of that's the only maintenance that I do. And then I always cover it up with a towel. Um, if it's not in use, it's covered up, especially because I live at the, you know, by the ocean. Um, and a pillowcase is always a good thing as well to put over it and, um, and make sure that your um, mill is bolted down to your bench or uh, you can get proper stands for them, but even the stand then needs to be bolted to the floor, really important. And um, I thought it was something else I was going to say. You, you just want to make sure that it's in a really good secure position so that, you know, you can use it correctly. But that's, that's, what I, that's all that I know about maintaining them. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. And what sort of text colour did you use for your arrow? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> a black one on my blue. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great, Penny. Well, I'm sure you've got um, people enthused to give that a bit of a whirl. So if they've got a rolling mill at home, I'll get out there and uh, try some texturing. And you've given some great tips on how to look after your, your rolling mill while you're doing that. So that's uh, important. But um, yeah. experimentation is the key. And Definitely. you never know what you're going to find. No. So you were yeah. explaining earlier, Penny, some of your best pieces of jewellery have come from just experimenting. Yep, experimenting and accidents. I keep everything, everything. Something that did not work is in a um, scrap tin. I have several different little pots of um, for scraps, you know, so um, I, I kind of almost uh, collect the shapes or the sizes of the metal so if I'm ever looking for just something tiny, I can just go to a little pot and have a rummage around and find just that perfect little piece. But even if it's as I'm making it, it um, starts to not go the way I wanted it to, um, I try not to get too kind of frustrated with it. Just pop it to side and, um, and then something will come out of it uh, and maybe not tomorrow, maybe not even the next day, but um, often those my best-selling pieces have been happy accidents at the bench really just keep everything and don't stress and go back to it later even if it's months later it really doesn't matter um i was making a pair of earrings for the longest time which was a circle and i had to cut another circle out of that circle so i had uh, dozens of these little circles and i was like there must be something that i can do with these tiny little circles so i drilled a hole in the larger circle and fed that onto the saw to cut the tiny circle out so the tiny circle had a hole in it at the top uh, so it wasn't a full circle and I'm not going to um, say that my sawing is perfect so it was not a perfect circle um, and eventually something came out of that and um, I cut almost like a little smiley face away from the tiny circle domed that put a loop on the top and turned it into a pair of earrings and um, now I don't make enough of the big earring <laughs> for the <laughs> little circle to make those ones because they are so popular. So, um, wow. yeah. And then uh, so therefore then what I did, I make a rectangular um, pendant that I cut another rectangle out of, but it's a thicker metal. So I use the rolling mill to, to roll out that the rectangle that I've cut out down to the right thickness for my little round earrings that I call handbags because I look like handbags. Mm -hmm. um, so that it's the right thickness to make the handbag. So um, I'm recycling all the time using my scraps. Uh, and that was um, a definitely a happy accident, that just looking at those tiny little circles thinking, what can I use? What can I do? How can I use this metal? I don't want to just waste it. Um, and even the little piece that I put on the top is a recycled piece of metal from another pair of earrings that I make. So, um, yeah, it's. I think uh, a lot of the times I leave things just sitting on my bench, hoping that um, inspiration will come from the scrap or yeah, you know, whatever it is that I've done. So definitely, happy accidents are the best best things. I think that's a lovely term. Uh, thanks for introducing that to us. Uh, no. Happy accidents, and I'm sure you'll encourage 
a lot of people to get out there and discover their own happy accidents. Yeah, definitely. Hope so. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for being on board this morning. Thank you to all of our audience for being there and with us on the journey. And we'll look forward to seeing you all next time. I'll give you another tip, Peter. Okay. I never go on a, a journey. It's always an adventure. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we'll continue our adventure very That's soon. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Penny. Thanks, everyone.